There we go. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the first ever public um, pit roundtable. And this is basically where I get a bunch of my friends from the internet and we get together and we talk about a topic that revolves around productivity, development, and some weird space in between. And that's kind of been what productivity and tech is all about. For those that don't know, um, it started in 2017, no, 16. Wow, it's a whole nother year now. Um, as just a podcast where I interview people in the tech space to see how they got stuff done, how they were able to accomplish things. And this is just the next evolution in that process. So with me today, and I, you'll see some quick photos here, we have Jamie Taylor, who is from GivePropNet. Uh, we have Joe Zach from the Complete Develop, not the Complete Developer Podcast, from Coding Blocks. There we go, <laughs> Coding Blocks. Sorry about that. Another great podcast that I... I so I'm a fan, big fan of Complete Developer. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we have Darren. Darren, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say. I'm a developer at Microsoft. That's about it. Hey, that, that is enough there. And then we have JW. How's it going? Hey, I'm doing well. Excited to be here and get this thing started. Let's go. All right. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's take a second. Um, this round table is going to go in a really cool format. Basically we're going to have a few questions and we're just going to go right down the list. Each person is going to give their two to three minute synopsis of, of or their answer. And then, um, after that, we will be looking forward to connecting with you on Twitter. Um, you can hashtag cut round table. Obviously, it's going to be after the fact because this isn't live, so that is okay. Tweet at us anyway at Prod and Tech, and then we'll be happy to get back to you and connect with you. And we do these every single month. Uh, basically, the first roundtable of the month is reserved for our Pit Premium members only, which you can find more about that at productivityandtech.com slash join. And we actually have two tiers now. So instead of just one massively expensive tier, we have two. We have a $5 tier and a $10 tier. I will not talk about that anymore for the rest of this conversation because I don't like promotion. It's nasty. <laughs> um, and then um, the second round table that we do the second week of every month is open to the public and anyone can join just simply. Uh, I don't really have a link for that, honestly. So just follow us on Twitter and then uh, there'll be more as that develops. Um, so let's jump right into it. This week's topic is getting started as a developer. And I wanted to start with this, obviously, because it's a new year. People have new ambitions. You always see an uptick in the number of people wanting to learn how to code at the beginning of the year. And for me, that really wasn't the case. I got out of the military and said, I'm going to be a programmer now. Um, but that was five years ago. And it's kind of hard for me to talk about what I did five years ago. So I wanted to get people from all different walks of life, all different developer experience levels to really come in and have this conversation. So let's start with question number one, which is what made you want to become a developer? And Jamie, we will start with you. Okay. Um, so for me, it was, uh, I was about seven years old and my parents, kind of went, here's a computer for you and your brother to play with. And uh, it came with a bunch of manuals and a bunch of, it was, um, oh goodness, it was an Amstrad, right? Which I think is a UK brand. Um, if you know of uh, Alan Sugar, who runs the UK Apprentice, um, it's his company. And it basically was a keyboard and you plug it into the TV and you put cassette tapes in it, which I guess a lot of people don't know what cassette tapes are these days. <laughs> um, and the software was loaded from the cassette tape or you could, you know, it came with these manuals, how to program and it was all in basic. So I'd sit there for a whole afternoon, just and then, you know, a stick figure would appear on screen. And I thought, that's really cool. I can make this computer do something. I have control over it. That's what I want to do with my life. And that's kind of, yeah, that was it really. Um, yeah. Cool. Sorry, sure. was... Sorry. Oh, okay. So, um, for me, um, you know, I was probably around seven as well, uh, which, uh, this dates me a little bit, but it would have been 1987 and uh, Nintendo was huge in my life. That was my first kind of really, um, 
you know, that was the thing that drew me in and a lot of, a lot of kids and a lot of people, I think in, in my generation. And uh, I still remember uh, getting Nintendo Power Magazine and, and seeing them. They used to have a picture of their office in Redmond. And uh, I used to look at that picture all the time and think about moving out to Washington. So I'm a little jealous of, a little jealous of Darren living out there. But uh, <laughs> I had a little experience with things like Lego Logo and Hyper Studio, Mac Paint kind of coming up um, just in the school system. But I never really had a way to kind of see what true programming was. I didn't know how to make the programs I was using. So I had a lot of fun with computers. So I was always around it, but I just didn't really see. I didn't know how to, to make that possible until I got into high school. And, and uh, my best friend, John, uh, had, had, he just knew how to do it. He was familiar with languages already in high school and he was just a really sharp guy and just understood how they worked. And so being able to know him and see uh, the things that he was able to do and the things that he understood about computers was just uh, it was like a, a lightning bolt. It was really exciting to me. And so I was uh, really, really lucky to have him in my life. And um, so that, that was a huge part of uh, a huge influence on my life. And um, so getting to meet him and kind of see the things he was able to do was, I was that was my ticket. Fancy, fancy, fancy. Good job, everyone. Good to go team. I guess it's my turn now. Um, I just want to kind of advocate that you don't have to start at seven to get to be a developer. <laughs> well, no, really. It's um, a lot of, uh, so, you know, you hear the really good developers in like college or the rock star program. It's sort of like, I started when I was in my mom's womb, already programming in Commodore 64. I had eight bits of RAM, exaggeration. Um, anyway, <clears throat> my story is how I got into video games was I wanted to make a better sonic game that was me it was you know in the time when sonic was going bad I'm like i'll make a better sonic game so i went to start going to college learning java um my dad and my then not brother-in-law um were also programmers and they helped me they're like you know here's a book in c plus plus here's this and they actually still support my endeavor um and then it was just college and my friend was like hey i here, you want to be a developer? You want to join the company I'm working at as a developer? I'm like, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's a uh, it's my story. I just I want to make a better video game. Haven't done that yet, but I still want to do it. <laughs> All right. So my perspective is a little bit different because I am a career changer. Um, I spent a lot of spent 14 years um, with music and a lot of creative things, playing piano, producing tracks. And then high school, even getting a business registered in my name, which kind of led me to go on to school to get my degree in business administration with folks in marketing. So then after spending six years in the workforce, like I've always had just this, this burning desire to get into the tech field. And it was actually, ironically, had to do with video games. I was sitting there playing Watch Dogs and I had been watching Mr. Robot and it just unlocked something in my mind to where I was like, I've got to learn how to do some of this stuff. Um, so I just, I made the decision to start teaching myself. I just looked up tech events in the area. I started going to free code camp and a lot of different meetups. And I just really fell in love with the process of learning and the critical thinking and creativity that's required to be able to build something. Um, and then, so I spent about six months doing that and decided I want to take this to the next level. So I resigned from my job, did a boot camp, just completed it yesterday. So now, you know, I'm, I'm going for the next step of my life. So I could be able to provide some insight on that whole process if anyone's interested. JW, question for you. Yes. Isn't it, isn't it, I mean, I guess it's for everyone, but you were talking, so I addressed you. Isn't it interesting where, like, you start coding, you're like, I can actually make the computer do something, not just click on a program, but, like, you get an innards and just, oh, that's such a wonderful feeling. It is, and I'm very passionate about helping, especially kids, transform their mind from being a strictly a consumer because they could use all the phones and tech and everything and computers but want them to think more like creators and know what's going on under the hood and around them with these things that we use every day so yeah i think that's fascinating awesome awesome and it looks like we have our next panelist miss angela andrews i think you're still muted but i'm glad to have you uh, we were just sharing our our stories of what made us want to become a developer. So uh, sure, take a few minutes and. Sure. Well, hi everybody. Um, I'm Angela and um, what made me want to become a developer was um, 
the need to know what was going on. Um, someone had asked me to make a website many, many years ago. And, you know, I knew the ins and outs of HTML and CSS, and it was, there's more to this. So I took a class and the bug hit me. And where it really blew up was when I came across this community um, in my local city called Girl Develop It. And to know that there were other people out there that were just as passionate, that were willing to help, um, it kind of blossomed into, oh my God, this is probably what I wanna do. So I started taking more classes, started taking more GDI classes, um, TA classes, and it's really hard to shift um, I think at my age, because I'm, you know, I'm past mid career, I'm a systems administrator. And it was, it was a kind of like a leap of faith, where it's like, you can't do this, it doesn't matter how long you've been in your career, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, it doesn't matter. I think the community is really what made it possible. Um, I'm not a developer yet, but I do a lot of developer things, I think. Um, like I said, I TA um, a couple of the workshops. Um, I am giving talks now. I'm planning on giving another talk on um, WordPress on an AWS instance. Um, so I just need to start making more things. But I've been doing a lot of, you know, a developer adjacent um, activities recently. Um, but I'll tell you about the jump uh, soon. So um, the route that I'm taking, it was, it's mixed with traditional and a lot of, I guess, um, untraditional where, yes, I've taken classes. I just finished um, the University of the Arts uh, web development program in September. And um, again, because I'm so in, enthralled with my current job as a systems administrator, um, it, I, I really haven't dropped everything yet. So that's part of the problem. Like I'm living in two worlds right now where one job is really, really challenging and I really like it. But the developer part of me, I'm, you know, now I'm learning Python, which is awesome. Um, which is, um, I see you're I see Kevin's very happy about that, um, which is very prevalent in um, the administrator space. So a lot of this is being married right now. And at some point I really need to make the cut and decide um, one way or another. Um, the stumbling box that I've come across was. Um, uh, uh, hold on. <laughs> one, yeah, one, one, I can one keep top, going. Yeah, one, one topic at a time. We're, we're, getting, we're oh. getting too far ahead. Um, oh. But no, I do love the fact that you mentioned that you don't necessarily have to hate your job to become a developer too. Like that's, that's something that I think a lot of people say is like, you know, oh, my job sucks and, and I can't you know, do the things that I wanna do. And if I was a developer, I'd make more money. And you know, there, there's, so many, there's so many things that look pleasing to it, you know, the idea of becoming a developer. But then at the same time, I've learned some of the best programs that I've made actually supported the current role that I was in. And that's a great entryway to get into the development space is like, okay, how can I build something that supports what I'm working on currently? Yeah, I am actually, uh, <clears throat> just to that story, Jay, that you were saying in, um, oh, my second job, I actually, there was a developer who was, I think a senior developer and he actually came for as a vet and he started that way. He's like, he made a little website and then more and more people were like, hey, can you make more stuff? And he's like, I like this more than being a vet. So there's just a lot of ways to get into that. Yeah, and I would actually mention too that there's all sorts of different <laughs> kinds of developers too. Um, you know, you can think of like a, a Steve Jobs kind of, um, archetype that's a more entrepreneurial based and, and based on kind of results or a Wozniak who's kind of more famous for being very much down in the weeds or, um, you know, someone like a, a security hacker, Mr. Robot kind of person, or, a, you know, even like a, I kind of think of myself as more of a tinkerer. Like I like to make little cool things and move on. So uh, it's a, it's a wide space to be in and there's all sorts of overlap with the, the, the real world, I guess. Very, very awesome. So let's take a second and transition to our next question, which um, we have a few more people in, in the uh, chat now. So we're going to have to coordinate this a little bit. So 
if you have something that you want to say, like throw it, throw it in the chat and then we'll, we'll <laughs> kind of jump over to you. Um, cause yeah, Irma, you, you've joined us as well. Welcome. Um, I'm probably going to stop, um, in like welcoming people now cause more people seem to be jumping in. <laughs> um, so our second question is, what was the first program that you were just absolutely proud of? Like, what was the first program that you built that you were just like, I can do this, you know, awesome. I'm, I'm so excited. Does anybody want to jump on that one? I'll take yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> Wait, who's doing it? Let's do, let's do Darren and then Joe. Okay. Which Joe? <laughs> Joe Zach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then we'll do JW. <laughs> um, hmm. I actually, to answer that question, I think of like the question, the program that I would give if somebody, if in an inter if phone interview, they're like, what's one program you're most proud of? Um, and that would actually be in school, we had to make a mock uh, DVD rental store that handled returns, uh, borrows, um, customer database, um, and basically a search history. And that was about like a three, I think it was like three to 4,000 line program in C++. Um, and this was the second time I took the class was because the first time I had to bail out because I wasn't having a good passing grade. But man, every day I got home, I worked on it. I had, you know, really nice inheritance hierarchy. It was the blast. And I was so happy when I finished it. Um, and I'm also proud of this because I added templates in, in, uh, to make them um, because we had to use binary trees. So I added templates. And then the next year, I saw that the same program actually had the requirement of you can't use templates. So I think that requirement there was because I did that. I might have cheated the system. I don't know. But that is the program I'm most proud of is that DVD store project. It's, it was the best. I love the programs that uh, cheat the system. <laughs> that's, I think that's like one of, that's one of the things that like makes programming fun is when you're able to go like, Oh, I can't do this. Well, I'll show you who's boss. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, I, they totally get it and we were actually um part of it was to work with other people to design them like well, let's use templates you know when you use lists you know bracket t we can use that for binary trees and all the students were like no let's have a binary tree of this and a customer binary tree and a dvd binary tree. i'm like no you're wrong <laughs> um, so unfortunately not 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 say they were super they were learning programming you know learning c plus plus and programming at the same time is extremely difficult so I don't blame them, but so I was like, fine, I'm, I'm do what I want. Leave you alone. Joe? All right. Yeah, so for me, um, I, I got my first start probably, you know, pretty early in the, the kind of the dot-com boom eras doing like basic HTML type stuff. And then I moved into some, some more dynamic type stuff and back in from there. Um, so what I was most proud of actually was um, kind of the opposite in the spectrum. You know, I'd grown up with Nintendo and grown up kind of uh, idolizing these computer programs I just I couldn't imagine making you with the UI tool sets and everything. And so there was some sort of um, draw I had to just having that EXE extension. So my, the, the programs I remember first being excited about and like trying to get up on the internet so I could get my friends to download them and show them were like these little like, crappy uh, kind of game demos where I would have a little guy walk up a ladder or something going to the door. And I thought it was so cool that I could make that stuff. These things that I'd, I'd idolized for so long, I could, make the screen do what I want. It's just so exciting to me. So even though, um, you know, technically they were just silly and um, didn't really have a purpose and I uh, did everything the wrong way. I was just so, so happy to be able to kind of realize my dream of, you know, making sprites move around. So that's the stuff that I, I still think about back to and that's still this kind of stuff I play around with now I'm um, having a lot of fun with like unity and stuff like that it's not what I do for work and my my love for programming has shifted a lot over the years I still just have a lot of fun just tinkering and making cool little things happen on the screen all right pretty cool um so I've made some pretty big projects in react recently that I'm really proud of but in terms of the first that I would say I was proud of um, one of the startups I was working for, I had to keep track of my time, my hours, um, myself. So I did, I would get to the end of the month and I, oh shoot, I have to calculate this up. So I was doing a lot of stuff manually. So 
when you're first going through a lot of these courses, you're learning how to do HTML, CSS, and there's the functionality. So I was learning a little bit of JavaScript, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to challenge myself to try to build a time converter that I could actually use myself. So that was when I really started to understand how to, how the um, JavaScript worked and how functionality worked. So once I was able to complete it and style it and actually use it and in real time for my job, I was proud, I was happy, and I was excited about the process. And that's something I'll always remember actually being able to use it. That's awesome. You know, one of the, the cool things with programming, like I said, you know, it, it really comes down to when you are doing something for that thing that you're already doing and you're able to make your life just that much easier. I think that was a huge, that was like a huge revelation to me as a developer was just like, Hey, I don't have to build a video game. I don't have to, you know, build the next Twitter or, you know, Amazon. I can just build something that's going to make my life or save me a few minutes. And that's great. Um, one of, one of the things that I, would say that I'm most proud of is um, kind of a cheat here. Uh, productivity in tech, like there is so much code. Um, there's probably somewhere between six and 10,000 lines of code that make productivity in tech the system that it is. And I mean, from the website, which is all hand coded by me, the, the podcast upload system, which is hand coded by me, um, interacting with the Mongo database. It's like, and, and every time I learn something new, it's like, oh, I can't wait to go apply that to my website. Like, it's like, that, that's what keeps me learning and makes me want to continue um, developing. But we're not talking about the, the story of the, the quote unquote seasoned developer. We're talking about the new developer. So we're going to jump right into question three. And that is, let me paste it really quick so I can't forget it. Um, what were some of the stumbling blocks that you ran into learning to code and how did you overcome them? Who wants to jump Jamie on this one? Jamie didn't answer question two. <laughs> oh, did, do we have more, more thoughts on, on yeah. question two? No, Jamie didn't answer at all. Jamie? He's He's muted. There you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, I think one of the, 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 the so I took a purely academic route. So um, over in the UK, computer science isn't really well taught, um, at least when I was growing up. So computer science, computer programming, development, all that kind of stuff isn't really well taught until you get to uh, college, which I guess is 16, 17. So I guess the end of high school. For, for you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, and it was when I got to to uh, to the to college and I was taking my you know my courses, I took an electronic engineering with um, low level programming course, and they gave me um, I remember to this day it's a Flight sixty eight K, which is a Motorola sixty eight K um, chip with a bunch of like RAM and EEPROM and stuff connected to it, and they said um, for your end of year assessment. You're going to write something in um, in assembler. So go have a look in the in the big storage cupboard and find some peripherals and just build something. So I was sitting there. I was you know sitting there thinking away. I walked over to the cupboard and opened it. And there's a rifle. And I thought, I know. Why don't I test the speed of the the the, the rounds, the bullets coming out of the rifle? So I set up. I jury rigged this thing where there was a there's this like rifle and then a strip of um, silver foil with some uh, crocodile clips, uh, alligator clips attached to it, which were attached to a reader, and then a meter, and then another set of uh, clips with another piece of foil, and um, and my all, all that the program did was you fired it up and it would wait for each of the the foils to uh, for the for the round to break through the foil, and then it would calculate how fast the round was going. By how far, how you know the distance between the the strips of foil, and it was when I did that and fired it <laughs> and scared everyone in the lab, <laughs> and they went, "Oh, brilliant! It's going at this many meters per second. <laughs> so cool. That's when I knew. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah, I'd be scared too if bullets went off in the lab. <laughs> I definitely have to introduce you. I'm, I'm going to include um, just a reminder to myself in the description to include a link to 
uh, the conversation that I did with Bob Butterworth, who is the creator of the Happy Quail targeting system. Um, <laughs> who did that? I'm pretty sure you two could get together and, and have a lot of fun. I think that would be funny. <laughs> All right. Um, Angela, did you have a, a project? I've had a, I've quite a few projects that I've worked on that I was just so proud. Any, getting anything to work seems to be just the bar. Like, oh my God, after all of this, it works. I probably think it wasn't one of, maybe one of my first, it was back in 2004. And I did this website for um, my motorcycle club. And it was, you know, no one had a website, which I thought was like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this really cool. Um, it was just pure HTML and CSS. And I used frames. Don't tell anybody. It was frames upon frames. So the buttons were frames. It had these really nice photo galleries. You know, the navigation at the bottom was frames. And I'm telling you that I was so proud of that. It seemed looking back on it, it it's the most hideous thing I've ever done. But I was so at the time, people were like bigging it up, like, oh my God, you guys, this is a cool website. And it had the galleries in it. So um I check it out on the Wayback Machine every now and again because it was it was probably one of the proud one of the biggest like you know this was even before i really got into coding and i it kind of sparked the interest but no that's by far i've done a lot of cool things since then but that's my proudest i love how there's such a, there's a wide range there's so many different things whether you're talking about just tracking your time you're putting together a website you know, you're testing the velocity of rounds, which again, I would make sure if you're going to go that route, do it in a safe area. Um, it's a scary first project, right? It really is, or at least the first big project. But uh, Angela, what you said there, just getting anything to work is like, ah, oh, it's like a huge relief. I don't think that ever changes. Like no matter what, I was coding last night and broke a ton of stuff and was like, ah, oh, crap. And then spent the next like four hours trying to get everything fixed. And then once it was fixed, it was like this, yes, I'm so happy. You know, I'm like, life is great. Um, so I, I definitely think that that's one of the ways that you know that you're meant to be a developer is when you get that small thing working and you're just like, this is like the biggest joy in the world to, to accomplish that little task. That's not a sign of, of like being a beginner. That's a sign of being a developer. Let's, let's talk about the big, this is probably going to be the biggest help for beginning developers, the stumbling blocks. Um, that is something that we all run into. Um, I, I think the big thing that like when you're first learning to code, you, you're learning so fast and you're learning so many things and it's hard for things to kind of stick because you know, if you're anything like me, I didn't go the, the, formal education route. I went through online learning and learning through communities and just building projects to, to make things happen. But in that, I learned that eventually you hit this plateau and you're just like, I don't, I, I don't know what I don't know. And I, and I don't know how to overcome that. What were, what were some of the stumbling blocks that you ran into on your journey to being a developer and, and what, was the biggest help in overcoming that? Let's see who wants to who wants to jump in, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, knowing that it's difficult. It's I mean, development's not easy. You know, uh, they're trying to teach it to kids, and there's a lot of things that you can teach the kids. You know, give them scratch and show them if you push this button, it will move forward, and putting things into steps. But I mean, even even Scott Hanselman, who is one of the project managers on ASP.net, he's a very, very, very smart guy. And even he says, it's not easy. So being able to sort of, sort of take a step back and go, I know that this isn't easy and I know that I'm stuck and asking for help, that's, that's the biggest stumbling block for me because 
um, because it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, imposter syndrome, I find. I have, I get imposter syndrome really badly and I'll be sitting at work going, I can't do this. I'm not supposed to be here. How have I managed to, you know, do this? And and just taking a moment to ask the person sat next to me, hey, can I just talk you through this problem? And talking through the problem will invariably get get you to come up with the solution. You know, they call it duck uh, rubber duck debugging, where you're speaking to a rubber duck or you're speaking to someone. And being able to do that, take, taking a step to one side and going, actually, can I get some help or can I just talk to you about this? And that's what fixes it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny how many tech problems you can solve with people. You know, either mm-hmm. talking it out or getting some, you know, different viewpoints or whatever. So um, my advice is always just uh, try to find an online community where you can jive and find people that you can talk to about your problems and work stuff out. And uh, I just realized I jumped out of turn. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> no, I think that's good. That, that's a good point to bring up. And then also, um, Irma, really quick mention, I, I think – not having immediate feedback for help. Uh, Joe, your, your thought really hits that. Um, you know, getting plugged into an online community, that's, that's why we have communities like Productivity in Tech. And then um, Code Newbie is another big one. And then, of course, the, um, uh, what, like, Girl Develop It and, like, the Django Girls for me, you know, from the Python space. There are, when you have those online communities, you're just, it's so much easier to get plugged in and get questions answered and not fall into like stack overflow hell, which I know is always like a pain when it's like, Oh, check stack overflow. And you're like, "Eh, well, I mean, telling that to a new developer is, is not really the way to go. (laughs) Uh, Joe, JW. Yeah, so one of the biggest stumbling blocks is the internet is a huge gift and a curse. There's so much information out there that's free, which is great, but that can lead you to, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to learn. This person said learn Python because it's the easiest. Oh, they said JavaScript. So one of the things that really helped me was, as you all are saying, community, getting on Meetup, looking up coding, tech, all of that, and that's what led me to free code camp. So being in the community of people, uh, develop consistency. So the second thing I would say, if you are doing an online course, just try to stick instead of what I did early on was when I got to something that was difficult or I couldn't figure out, I'll say, maybe I need to switch to this one. Let me kind of start over. I, I think I need to try something else. And it's going to be difficult. You're going to hit that with whatever course you go through because it is tough. So just trying to stick through, make it to the end um, will be another one. So definitely being around people for consistency and trying to stick to at least make it through a course. I just want to piggyback off what you just said, Um, working uh, along with someone. I just started uh, this Python Django course and I heard of, I met a young woman who was interested in learning Python herself and she hasn't been doing it very long. I guess they use it at her job and she's like, I'm really not making any progress. So I said to her, how about we go through this Udemy course together? Like we'll watch videos, we'll do the projects and we'll come back together. So right then and there, we created this really small community and now both of us are learning um, with each other. It was, it was, it wasn't, I shouldn't have picked up this project, but I did now that I feel that I'm invested. um, I have someone that, we can bounce stuff off of, and granted, it's only the two of us, but we're we're also a part of a bigger community in the area, you know, the GDIs and the code newbies and things like that. So um, it's even those small intimate communities where if you can find just another like-minded soul, um, you could really make a headway and progress. And Again, it's really hard to learn in a vacuum. So if you can reach out to anybody to get any type of question asked, you know, Stack Overflow can suck it sometimes because, you know, it's like, I'm just going to read and see what I can find because you can't tell a newbie that's where they should go because nobody wants that type of abuse. Um, Some of us are a little bit more thick skinned and it doesn't bother us as much, but um, make even the smaller communities just reaching out to someone trust me twitter is the place to be when you come up against any type of issues because someone is going to be kind enough to um take your question and answer it um 
with with compassion. They're not going to you know shoot you down or anything like that. So I find that the smaller communities in 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 relation to the bigger communities have been most helpful for me on my journey. There was a tweet that I think Stephanie Hurlbert sent out that says, hey, you know, be sure to let people know when and how you can help them. And I, I think that tweet has gone like semi-viral where, you know, you have people that are like, hey, this is what I'm proficient in and I'm always willing to chat, just send me a DM. And like you said, Twitter is one of those places that it does get a bad rap sometimes for its toxicity and for good reason. Um, but there is like this secret cove of, of developers that are just so willing to help. Um, April Winsel and Compassion Coding, like, I mean, she's, she's starting a, she runs a business that's all about helping developers be more compassionate towards other developers. And I think that that's just absolutely amazing. I didn't even know that was a business model, but like she is just killing it right now. I love it. And, and again, you have the code newbies out there and you have these other communities that are not just online, but are in person. Um, I was planning on going to a, a local meetup in San Diego, you know, today, because I know that just being around those other developers, we don't even have to talk. Like I, I've learned that like we can just sit there and know like, Hey, if I do have a question, there's someone here that can lend a helping hand or if someone else has a question, I'm more than happy to help. And I think that just feeling like you're safe to ask questions and you're safe to uh, get plugged in is way more than enough. Um, Darren, you had a, you had a comment as well. Yeah. I actually wanted to piggyback of what Angela said. It was pretty great about how, how some people have thick skin and how sometimes you can go onto the internet, uh, Twitter or Reddit and be like, I have help. And everyone's like, you suck. Um, <clears throat> one of the Coding Blocks podcasts, I think it was either Michael or Alan, um, was like, yeah, I made a link on Reddit and no one put me down. And no one was like, you suck and you're stupid. And that's just what I thought. I was like, yeah, that, that's, uh, that happens sometimes on the internet where everyone's like, dude, what you did was just was crap. And then you feel horrible. Oh yeah. <laughs> Wasn't me, but I remember that very well. Um, but, uh, yeah. So what, um, the question is the screen isn't moving down. Uh, once I can move in my chat. Yes. Uh, only box. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Box. Um, I have two, I'm going to go really quick. I actually had three, but I'm like, just let's pick the two best. One is, uh, once you start making a program on your own and you don't have anyone to hold your hand, you will, it'll freeze and you'll be like, what do I do? How do I get from point A to point B? Because your professors or maybe coding school or if you're online, a lot of them will have exercise and be like, okay, just fill in this part. Uh, I did a JavaScript thing and it's like, all right, just fill in like you're going to do constant log, just write what you need to write. Um, but if you're starting out, you're like, I want to make a website. You're like, well, how do I do that? So not having your hand held. And the second one is um, when you start a side project, if you make it too big, you're going to fail. Uh, I was making a, trying to make a Warhammer 40K battle simulator. And I made all the inheritance hierarchy. Yeah, I play Chaos Demons. It's pretty nice. I'm waiting for the new code. I'm, I actually have the codex on order. <laughs> anyway, um, and I made the inheritance hierarchy. I made all of the classes. Uh, it was so great. And once I was done, I started to code. I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Do I do the IO first? Do I do the stats first? Do I do that for this first? And I actually deleted it all. And I started just making one main method and then starting to expand out on that. So the other um, block is if you start to make a side project that's way too big, you are going to fail because you're not going to know where to start. I, I think that's, that's big too, because you do like, it's good to have these huge ambitions, but then at the same time, it's like attack them with reason. Like at the end. And I, I think it was, uh, it was Jamie actually, no, Darren, you too. You talked about like wanting to build a video game and still not having to having done it yet. That's okay. It's like, 
if my goal isn't, or if my end goal is to build a video game, I feel like the way that you attack that is you start with like a small portion. It doesn't matter what small portion. Don't focus on the video game. Focus on like, I want to create a sprite. I want to make a character move up and down, left and right whenever I hit ASDW, you know, like as long as you know where to just get started or not even get started, but as long as you have something small that you can build, like, like they say, the, was it the path, the journey to of a thousand miles begins with one step. Like, I mean, each, each pyramid was built with a single brick and that's the same way that programming is. You don't have to build the entire thing out and be like, yay, I built this whole thing. Now I'm a programmer. Once you build hello world, it's like, okay, great programming part done. Now let's, let's expand on that a little bit. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for, um, kind of using uh, or finding the right community. Like Reddit is a great place to learn and kind of see the, the day's, uh, you know, hottest, uh, hottest articles, right. Or hottest, hottest news, especially the programming where it's so big, it's not a good place to ask for help. You're going to get eaten up and destroyed. But if you can find a smaller, more niche topic, like uh, something that's within your framework or, um, you know, your, um, just the more closely aligned with your interest in what you're trying to do, then that's generally going to be so much better. Jamie, I think you had a, uh, a point as well. Yeah, it's just, um, I guess, uh, going on what you were saying, you know, you, you, if, if you set yourself this lofty goal of, I want to make a game or I want to build a website, you have to work in small, in small piecemeal parts. You've got to be able to, like you say, go from, you know, I've got, I have, uh, I can make, like you say, make a sprite move around on screen or, or, uh, just display something on screen. You know, you got to start there and build on top of it. You know, there's a guy, um, I forget the name of uh, the guy's name, but he's, he's, he started a project two, three years ago um, um, called Handmade Hero, where he is in two hour blocks building a video game entirely open source using absolutely no libraries. And I think he's gotten to the point where he's got sprites on screen and they're moving around, but it's taken him two years to get to that point but that's because he's writing every single line of code himself. But, you know, and, and there, are, there are people in the world who can make Minecraft by themselves or make Super Meat Boy by themselves. But if you look at, you know, most of the people who say, I want to make a video game, look at, you know, they're looking at Call of Duty or, or NFL 2K17 or, you know, FIFA or something and say, I want to make that and not realize that it's made by a team of about 5,000 people. You know what I mean? <laughs> And that's how they can get get the whole thing running, you know. And um, and 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 that's it. You've got to break your problem down, you know. Don't think it. Don't look at like looking at a car. A car isn't made as one big chunk of metal. It's made of there's a chassis and there's an engine and a transmission. Then you could break that down even smaller into you know there's the fuel injection pump and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's it it is. It's breaking it down and and realizing today I'm going to work on this bit. And if I don't get this bit done, I'll just park it and maybe look at this bit or I'll get some help and look into something else, you know? I think there's something to be said for staying small too. Like there's nothing wrong with being a really great tire maker or, you know, focusing on carburetors or the things that you like. And uh, so uh, I, I think a lot of people, especially in the beginning, um, they'll get intimidated by seeing something like that, the, um, the, the Hero Project, where it takes so long and it's so daunting. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of people also that will use a lot of third-party libraries and stuff and, um, even learning the ins and outs of those can be really intimidating. So uh, I think it's just a matter of figuring out what really speaks to you and what your personal goals are. All right. So everyone, great answers along. We're going to jump into the last question, which isn't really a question. It's, it's more of what advice if you had a, someone right next to you that says, I want to learn to be a developer. What, what advice would you give them? I would like to start this question because I Go know ahead. about this answer. I actually started a meetup before te helping people learn to be programmers. Um, <clears throat> and that is, uh, it, it really depends. Yeah. So in the context of if somebody's sitting here right next to me, no programming experience at all, um, I would really say it's, uh, don't worry about right now getting a job. Cause I mean like, you know, have a side project, contribute to GitHub, do all the stuff, read books. And if you're just starting out learning that 
if you go, you know, if you have int x equals five, okay, x equals x plus one, and you look at it and you're like, you can't do that, that's impossible, x can't equal x plus one, you're not in the realm to start contributing on an open source project. Um, so would be really persistence and diligence because a programming language is literally a language. It's not as uh, fluid and dynamic as English or other like spoken languages, but it does have its own syntax. You can't put an else before an if. Well, technically you can if you do if, else, if, else. But you can't start an if, else with else. You have to say if. And, and there's, synta there's syntax, syntactical differences, and it, it's a language, and it will be extremely hard um, after about a year or so, that's when you get when you get to the point of like, okay, I start to understand this. I can make something, um, and yeah, that it's just, it is extremely difficult. And don't pay any mind to the people who started programming at the age of two and out of high school. They already have a job. Don't pay attention to the people, the person who made Minecraft. Don't pay attention to video games that are like AAA and that you can't make. That just start doing something and talking to people, and you'll find your way. You know, I, I think, as you mentioned, there are, there are so many syntactical differences in like all of the different languages out there. Um, I, if I were to give any advice, I would say, find a language that best sounds, you know, great to you and stick with it. Even, even when it becomes a stumbling block, stick with it. Um, I, a little bit about my coding journey, I went through Code Academy for, this was back when Code Academy had like four different tracks and I went through each track all the way through. And at the end it was just like, I still don't know what I want to do. And like I, I tried Ruby for a while and then couldn't figure out rails. And it was just like, you know what? I really like that Python thing. Let me just go do that. And then everyone was like, Oh, Python's for data science. Like, no, I want to build websites with it. And they're like, Oh no, you got to do Django. And I don't like Django. I'm just going to do this instead. It's like, it's not necessarily a do what you want, but do what you feel you are going to be passionate about doing. Um, and, and that's, I mean, I still get terrified every time I have to program in JavaScript. You, you can ask Jamie, like he's watched me stumble my way through like a JavaScript nightmare. And it's just, when I do it, I still get that newbie like anxiety of like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what's wrong. I'm so frustrated. I just want to get back to my Python where I feel safe and, and life is great again. So I would, I would definitely say like, don't listen to what people tell you you have to learn first. Start learning that thing that really resonates with you and that thing that you're you know, most passionate about. Nicely spoken. Uh, Jamie? Yeah, um, so what I was gonna say was um, that on the back of what you were saying, you know, pick a, just pick a language that makes sense to you and start. Um, there, in in the in the same vein that there is no real one tool that will do everything in development, or uh, one language that will do everything, you can write a pro like you were saying, you can write websites in Python, even though people were saying it's date for data science. You can write uh, so like uh, when I went to university. We studied prologue for artificial intelligence. From what I can, from what I've learned after university, you typically use Lisp for artificial intelligence and then a little bit of Python. But um, but what you you know the the point I'm making is that you can write a calculator in in prologue. That this language that is supposed to be for artificial intelligence, you can write graphics libraries in JavaScript. You know you can you, if you if you have the wherewithal and the, the sort of intestinal fortitude, the drive to stick with it. You can build almost anything in anything. So like you were saying, just pick a language, the one that fits with you and just learn to make things in that language. And then when you feel confident with it, maybe take a step to the side and say, oh, right, so I've learned a little bit of Python. Maybe I need to learn some JavaScript or maybe I need to learn some C or some C sharp or some, uh, go or whatever, you know, take, take it a step at a time. Don't go, I need to know all the languages to do all the things, you know, because you, no one is going to be able to program in every single language with every single framework, with every single library. It's just not possible. There's that much information out there, you know? So it's just pick a small subset of things and build on them in tiny amounts. That's what I would say. 
One more thing. Um, I would, if someone asked me, um, what should I do to get into to development? I would, yes, say, find that one thing. I find that a lot of new developers, people who are learning to code, um, they want to try everything. And I found that when you do that, you don't get really far in, you can't be a jack of all trades. Um, you can find something that you like, give yourself maybe you know 60, 90 days, see how it feels. What I find is, and I see this in these communities, people are, oh wait, but someone said I should try this. Oh, but this seems nice. And I swear to you, you're gonna waste more time um, trying to figure out different things and you're not gonna make much progress. I do agree. Find something that you like, stick with it, go forward with it and see where it leads you. You know, if you don't like it, you then have the opportunity to say, no, nope, this isn't for me. Dogs. Um, you have the opportunity to say, maybe this isn't for me, but you have to give it a try. You can't give up. You can't just go a week or two days or 10 days and say, you know what, now I'm gonna try something different. You won't learn anything that way. That's the best advice I would give. You know, something and really quick that you know, Angela, that you just mentioned was being a jack of all trades. Most prominent developers are not jacks of all trades. Like most of the big names in development do one thing and they do it extremely well. I mean, you have like the, the Kenneth Wrights who just, I don't know, they think about something and then five minutes later, it's like a completely full-fledged open source project. And then of course you have the, the Guidos and the, the people who are architecting languages. But when I think of some of the developers that I know, some of the people that have taught me a ton of knowledge in the space, they come and ask me questions about things that I've kind of made my little specialty. But then I also know like, hey, I can go talk to them about their specialty. Uh, most of these prominent developers, most of these career developers are really just, like you said, they're, I won't say one trick ponies, but they, they have the majority of their knowledge in this particular area in this particular language. Uh, JW. Yeah, I'll keep it nice and brief. We've already driven home this point, but definitely community. Uh, before I even started to sit down to learn, I went to like two different events didn't understand the thing that was going on, but I was able to walk away with one or two things. And then even if I still go to events and I don't know everything that they're talking about, I may hear a conversation of people talking in passing and they'll mention something. I'm like, I might want to look into that when I get home. So I feel like I get value every time I go. And like I said, just understanding what people are actually using, people that work in the industry are actually using the building. And just and it's just fun too, being able to do things with other people. You know, it really helps with you sticking with it and getting to your goals. So jump on meetup.com, eventbrite.com, just start to search code, coding, programming. You'll find all kinds of events for free. Jamie? Yeah, I hey, uh, just wanted to say uh, on the back of what you were saying, Jay, um, that, you know, you pick something and you do it really well, you know, and then uh, I put in the, in the chat uh, a quote by, a character from one of my favorite sitcoms, which is MASH, and the character, Major Charles Emerson Winchester III says, I do one thing at a time, I do it very well, and then I move on. And that's kind of the point. You know, if, if you look at uh, the, like you said, the Guidos, the Scott Hanselmans, the Steve, uh, yeah, the Steve Wozniaks, these kinds of people, Bill Gates, they, they focus on this very small, this one task, they do it and then they move on, you know, you know I mean, if, if you were going in for surgery on, say, your knee, you wouldn't go see an eye specialist. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thought process. That's, you know, and, and again, with community, you know, um, uh, you know, JW is right. You know, you've got to find a group of people that you can, even if you're not helping, and even if what the person's talking about isn't relevant to you, something in that room or something on the journey, something on the journey back, something will sit and go, hey, go check this out. Or think about this or this is the problem this is the solution to your problem you know and even just like sitting with someone who uses a technology you've never even heard of it will help you in some way that you don't even realize it's it's crazy how it all works 
I, I definitely think that you can't, you know, when we're talking about, you know, focus on one thing, you know, be the master, you know, of that one area. That doesn't mean that you can't look and gain inspiration from other fields. I, I think that's, it's kind of a balance. You can't just say, okay, if I'm going to learn Flask, I'm going to learn absolutely everything about Flask and I'm never going to look at anything regarding Django or I'm never going to look at anything on Ruby on Rails or I'm not going to look at any of this other stuff. Well, I mean, that's how languages die. Um, when, when you start saying this is the correct way and always the correct way to do it, then yeah, you will fall into that trap. But I will say I have received the best success in my programming experience by saying I want to focus on development with, with MongoDB and Flask. And I'm going to look at how that looks in the web platforms in the world, how that looks in, the, in all of the web development space. I'm going to look at what React is doing. I'm going to look at what Angular does. I'm going to look at Vue. I'm going to look at you know, Node. And I'm going to see how can I replicate some of that great stuff in my own architectures, even if that means looking at, like Jamie, uh, like Jamie just said, looking at learning jQuery versus learning vanilla. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life devoted to learning these, these things, but I will look into it and say, Hey, you know what? That one thing right there is really cool. I wonder if I can implement that in the language that I prefer to use. I wanted to mention too, that if you're listening to this or watching this video, then you're already on the right path. You're, you know, taking a step towards reaching out to that community, becoming that part of things. Um, so if you could, you know, join the next one of these or get involved with, uh, with any of us, you know, if, we, if, we, if someone has Twitter, you can reach out to them. That's kind of what Twitter's for is for communication, right? So it's okay to send somebody a tweet and ask them a question or ask them advice or just, you know, kind of get to know them better. And uh, so don't be afraid to do that. And don't be afraid to get out there. Even if you're an introvert, you know, it's, it's doable. Yeah, I, I have annoyed the Coding Blocks Twitter account a few times. No annoyance at all. Yay! Um, I do have one thing to say. It's quite interesting. So I started a meetup to actually help people learn programming. <clears throat> um, I actually had someone come who had social anxiety, which was actually a great leap of faith for them. Um, I, my girlfriend has social anxiety, and I've been able to slowly understand what she's going through. Uh, and it's, it is extremely hard. And it's not just, you know, I know most of software developers can be described as introverts. You know, if I'm, at, I'd rather stay in my office and not talk to somebody than get up and talk to somebody, even though I need their help. I'd rather I am them instead. Um, but there is, you know, for us, we've done this. We're in the profession already. So we can be like, oh yeah, do these things, do these things. But for someone new or someone who doesn't have some kind of um, handicap, like social anxiety, it's much more harder for them um, and even if you think it's hard, you know, reach out. You'll totally try to help and try to learn because I think that's one thing about software developers is we just always like learning and being like, ooh, what is this shiny new thing? For example, I'm learning Pascal because I was like, ooh, what is this? It sounds cool. Awesome. Well, I think that is going to wrap up the round table discussion, the first round table discussion. I'm so happy that we were able to get this done. Thank you for all of my guests for showing up and presenting some really good topics. Um, before we let, before we let everyone go, most of us are doing something in the space. So I guess our last question is tell everybody what you're doing. Um, whether it's in programming, whether it's in learning to program, um, so if someone out there who is watching is interested, they can reach out to you. And we'll just go down the list. I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> um, what I'm doing right now is I am planning a workshop on how to learn WordPress and create child themes. And that is a workshop that I'm giving uh, really soon. And I'm also giving a talk on WordPress in AWS. So um, if anyone is interested, um, hit me up. I'm on Twitter at Scooter Phoenix. Yes, that's my name. And um, I'm really active in the GDI community. 
I'll be TAing intro to JavaScript real soon. I'm always in the intro to HTML, CSS, TAing those. So please reach out. Um, I'm willing to help anyone if I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'm sure I know someone that does. All right. Darren? Oh, your mic's muted. There we go. Yes, I'm actually going on to Twitter right now so I can figure out my Twitter handle. Because <laughs> I have, um, it's either Actifier or Actifier Ball. I switch between the two. I usually do Actifier, but if that's, doesn't, uh, if that's taken, I use Actifier Ball. Uh, Actifier Ball is what I have. Awesome, then that's me. Um, what I'm working on right now is I'm actually learning Haskell. Uh, when in my five month hiatus between jobs, I was like, I want to learn different languages. So, because that's just kind of the next almost step, because learning different languages allows you to express things in your own language. Uh, so, learning Haskell. Right now, I'm reading the Haskell book. It's pretty nice, it's a bottom up approach to Haskell. Um, I'm about I have about like six left to go. And after that, what I plan to do is actually stream me trying to make a project in Haskell to show people, even though you're a professional developer, once you switch to a new language that's like backwards from what you're used to, you're not going to immediately be able to program in it. It's going to be, okay, I need to make an int. Okay, I, N, T. And just, it's, I don't know, it's, um, you're not proficient once you change and you're trying to learn your productivity is going to go down. So I want to make a Twitch stream or some kind of streaming or YouTube video to show that even though you're a professional developer, when you're learning, it's not a quick snap like that. It does take time. So Haskell. Really quick, because I mentioned that I would do this for someone who wanted to be here but can't. Um, another great way to get plugged into the programming community and to learn how to become a developer is to start watching other people do it. Um, there are so many people on YouTube and that are on Twitch. Um, I'm going to plug him, uh, E.W. Durbin, someone that I watch a lot and someone that I actually helped uh, show the ways of, of streaming. Um, but that is a great way to learn um, on Twitch and on YouTube. And even if they're not live, you can still go back and watch the VODs and watch the tutorials. I've learned so much through that. Uh, Darren, you said you had, you had something else as well? Yes, I just wanted to also give my Twitter handle. It's um, at ActiveFireball. That's all. In case you want to get a hold of me, um, I'm usually on there. I also sometimes have it on at work. Don't tell anybody. Except for all of you, too. <laughs> all right, JW, what you got going on? Yeah, so just wrapping up, um, I just made, I worked on a fitness tracker app with, um, we were working in a team. I worked primarily on the front end, but it was full stack. So we use React on the front end. We use Node, SQL for our database, also Express to go along with Node. Great experience. So now I'm, um, I'm going to be picking back up a project that we started for a hackathon. Um, so hopefully we could win that, get that prize money and get the contract. Um, and then also I've been writing Medium articles. I've actually had a few published with Free Code Camp and with Codeburst.io. So you can find me on Medium at Mighty Joe W. Um, I'll also be putting some things on YouTube. So you, you can find me everywhere at Mighty Joe W, Twitter, YouTube, you name it. So, yeah, and I'm going to be hitting the job market pretty hard. So that's what I'll be, what I'll be focusing on in the next few weeks. All right, Jamie. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so um, I'm available at .net call blog. D-O-T-N-E-T-C-O-R-E-B-L-O-G um, on Twitter. Um, and that's because I, uh, at the end of 2016, I started a blog where I went, I'm going to learn .NET Core. And I, I, I learned it. <laughs> or rather, I am learning it. You know, you, like I say, you pick up bits and you use it. Um, so I've been doing a lot of t uh, tutorial posts and I've been doing some um, live streaming of building stuff with .NET Core. Um, and that's all available on, I mean, there's a link to the blog on the Twitter if you want to do that, or if you want to learn some stuff about .NET Core, or, you know, um, or, or I can point you in the direction of someone um, who does that kind of stuff. And on the back of what Angela said, I may have to get in touch because I want to learn WordPress. So, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, that's it, right? So I'll have to get in touch with you so I can learn WordPress. You know, I've got a few sites that run it, but I don't really know how the internals work. And I want to know how that works. So that might be my next project, you know? The, the power of community. This is why we do this, so that my friends can meet my other friends and connect and, and make all that happen. Um, Joe, let's wrap it up with you. All right. Yeah. And also, I want to mention the Waffling Tailors podcast. I don't know if uh, Jay forgot about it, but uh, great show. I'm a big fan. So didn't want to didn't want to lose that. Um, most of my extracurricular activity goes into uh, at Coding Blocks on Twitter, or you can find we you know we got a blog, we do a podcast, we do all sorts of stuff. And uh, this year, I'm trying to particularly focus on kind of coding and soft skills and um, doing my little tinkering side projects and making more videos and content. And so. Um, if you're interested in any or all of those things, um, just, you know, send me a message or something at coding blocks. All right. And of course I have actually had a few of these people on the productivity in tech podcast. And I will also link to those episodes. So if you're not yet subscribed to the productivity in tech podcast, what are you doing? Go to productivity and and click on the podcast link there. You will find all of our, awesome shows. We've been around for two years now. It's crazy, but, um, go there. These episodes will also be on that podcast as well. So if you couldn't catch all of it, or if you have to go to work, that's fine. You can catch the audio of this on there as well. And I have to let you know, because as we've mentioned, community is such a big deal here. The productivity in tech premium community is now available. Um, we have two tiers. We have a $5 a month tier and a $10 a month tier. The $5 a month tier gets you access to our private Slack channel where you can ask questions and you can become a better developer, a better person in tech, a better system administrator, a better whatever it is you want to be in your tech journey. Um, and you'll also have the accountability of others who are just like you to help you along with that. And then of course we have a premium tier that comes with all of those great things, as well as some sneak peeks into some special projects that I'm building for this year, as well as a monthly productivity call. And of course, when you do that, you'll also get access to our pit premium roundtable, which is just like this, but reserved only for those premium members and our upcoming topic with that as I'm rambling because I did not prepare myself for this question. And the upcoming topic for that conversation is something that I can't remember. So we're just going to skip that part. And I'm going to say thank you all for joining Joe, JW, Jamie, Darren, Angela, Irma, and everyone else that is watching. This has been the Productivity in Tech Roundtable. And thank you and have a great day. Thank you all.